there will be no finishing this. Because if you're doing it right, there will never be enough. You will never have enough love. You will never not want to love the people you've been given. And in fact, the more you love them, the more completely painful it will be to lose them. I'm JJ Heller. And I'm Dave Heller. And this is Instrumental. In every episode, we explore the instrumental moments that made our guest who they are today. We hope our conversation reminds you that every second matters because none of us knows which moment will be the one that changes everything. Big love happens in the small moments. Hi, friends. Hi, enemies. No, you don't have enemies. Uh, do, you don't know who's listening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I suppose that's true. There could be people out there <laughs> plotting to destroy you. I made this podcast for them. For your enemies? It's for everyone, enemies and friends included. Oh, wow. Okay, you're all invited. And we have a lovely episode for you today. We interviewed Kate Bowler. She is a PhD, a New York Times bestselling author, a podcast host, and a professor at Duke University. She's also a cancer survivor, and that plays a huge part in our conversation with her. She actually talks about it quite a bit in her book that just came out this week. It's called No Cure for Being Human. JJ, how did you discover Kate? I think I just stumbled across her on Instagram, but I started following her during the lockdown because she was posting these beautiful liturgies to people who were afraid or suffering (laughs) or unsure. Um, And I just found her words to be so comforting in a time where I really needed to hear them. And there is a little bit of adult language in this episode, so it might not be appropriate for children, but we think that what Kate has to say is very important, and we are so glad that she took the time to share her story with us. Our conversation with Kate begins at a point in her life where she's wrestling with some really big questions, beginning her professional career while also trying to discover how to integrate the worlds of academia and motherhood, all while experiencing some significant health issues. Here's Kate. I think in academia, where I always wanted to be in professor world, there's a lot of pressure on women to figure out if and how they're going to be able to have kids. So I heard a lot of messages early on that it was probably not advisable for women to have kids or maybe multiple kids would be like a real career derailer Hmm. because the years in which you're supposed to simultaneously be like biologically productive you're always trying to time it with whatever your health insurance is and also in the very same moment where you're suddenly magically supposed to produce a million books I just really wasn't even sure how to have multiple dreams at the same time I had a lot of health complications at the time when I was trying to figure out like what eventually was diagnosed as like a chronic pain issue that was really just joint instability, but it would mean that my joints would flare up and I would find it almost impossible to do basic things like chop watermelon or wash my own hair or things like that. And so Hmm. layering on top of that, just wanting to have a kid, I didn't realize, of course, that when you get pregnant, then you all of a sudden your joints turn to jelly and my joints were already jelly. So I found it very hard to keep a pregnancy. And then when I did, I found it so unbearably painful that I, I would find sometimes that people were talking to me and then I would realize that they'd been talking for a bit Wow! <laughs> and I, I wasn't able to like, uh, hear them sometimes just cause the pain was so loud. I was at a graduate student dinner where you're supposed to be really excited about your program to 25-year-olds who are about to surrender their lives to the feudalism of academia. And this colleague was, I think, explaining to me something about his new book. And I was about five minutes in, apparently, sitting across from a dinner when I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. It's just this this baby is really loud. And so I, I spent... Uh, I spent hours just trying to float in the bathtub to try to take the pressure off. I I, I thought, honestly, it was normal that 
pregnancy as uncomfortable. And it's only when I was like a couple hours into labor that I was really relieved and so happy and cheerful that it like just wasn't nearly as bad as having endured pregnancy that I was like, oh, I think this was like a lot harder than I... <laughs> <laughs> then wow. I sort of <laughs> wow. gave this credit for. Yeah, when when labor is the reprieve, that's a red flag. <laughs> yeah, I also found I had to like have a lot of conversations with nurses when I was like, hi, you're going to have to ignore my cheerful affect, but I'm actually in, in a lot of pain. <laughs> but, so they, they tried to turn me away from the hospital when I was like almost ready to give birth because I just looked so pleasant. And I was like, oh, no, you're going to have to admit me. I'm ready to have a baby. And I was. So when he was not just a thing to endure, but an absolutely hysterical baby frog, like he just had these giant blink, blink eyes. And then they had one of those terrible labors that no one really should ever talk about. And then they cleaned him up and put him in my arms, and I, I immediately said, uh, "Oh, it was you, it was you the whole time." Hmm. That just like that was probably my most intense experience of just magic, of like pure Holy Spirit magic, where there's someone else and it wasn't you. It's such a terrible way to have the luckiest day of my life, but that's always been weirdly the very luckiest moment. I've ever experienced. It wasn't until later that I kind of noticed that every guy that I had in my um, kind of cohort of young scholars had three kids and that every woman had one or none. Hmm. Huh. And I thought, uh, and it took us a bit to kind of piece that together and realize that we'd all had the same imagined timeline, the same fears, the same compressed schedule, the same, like, difficulty getting pregnant when we'd felt like we'd had to wait for so long. Wow. There's, like, kind of a solidarity there. Yeah, or a grief. Hmm. I mean, I think by the time we realized that the advice we'd all gotten, it was, it was all a bit too late. I mean, I don't know another career that is quite so, like, precarious where you go into it just out of love because you're because your vocation. You're not doing it for the money is what you're saying. <laughs> well, you can't even do it for the money <laughs> if you want to. It's not possible. <laughs> so nobody is able to. Yeah. And so I felt very lucky to get into um this program called the Young Scholars and American Religion Program. And so we had a few years of subsidized togetherness where we got like a week in a hotel once a semester for a bit. <laughs> Luxury. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it felt really like we were being fed. It was very exciting. I think we'd been together a few times before we realized that all of us had had some kind of hard, unwanted advice about whether we could have kids, that we were all running a, an invisible math that we hadn't really been sure of until we started hearing each other's stories. Hmm. You end up having a child. He becomes a toddler. You're navigating childcare and all of this stuff. And then along comes this diagnosis. How does that unfold? I'd been having really weird stomach pain for a bit. And so I went to the doctor and then they didn't know what it was. So I went to another doctor and then they didn't know what it was. And then I got very assertive and went to like 12 more doctors and then none of them seemed to have a very good interpretation. A lot of fuzzy could be your gallbladder. It could be just sort of naming random organs. And um, then the pain got, and I was used to pain by that point. So I found it kind of hard to figure out like what constitutes like really out of the ordinary pain. But it was to the point where I was like doubling over when I was walking. Hmm. And then I would just kind of like take a minute and then I would sort of resume because I was between doctor's appointments just looking for a diagnosis at some point I just went to the ER and I was like I can't I really can't do this and they sent me home with Pepto-Bismol oh, wow. said that it must have been very stressful for me there was a lot of assumption and I've had this ever since I kind of started having a a career that was really cool was that when I had a lot of pain that I was that certain doctors would explain to me that it was probably that the stress of a big career, like one here at Duke, was really getting to me. Huh. It just became absolutely unbearable until 
I was kind of through another scan and then finally in a doctor's office with a surgeon who said that he just wasn't willing to operate because they didn't have a clear enough diagnosis. And I used my healthy outdoor voice <laughs> and I was like, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving this office until you come up with a scan. I mean, this is just like, I'm not, I'm not doing a single other thing until you come up with another step for me. Hmm. And I figured it must be like a, cause they thought maybe it was like a faulty, yeah, some kind of like gallbladder, hormonal, something, something, nothing that serious. I certainly had zero cancer in my family, so I'd never would have imagined that it would be something as bad as it was. And then I was just in my office, um, walking on my little very dignified office treadmill when uh, the physician's assistant called to say that it was stage four cancer and that I was going to have to walk from my office into their ER and that they would take me right away. And that was, and like my whole life changed in an instant. is surreal. There's nothing coherent about something that feels that impossible. Just completely impossible. You hang up the phone and what goes through your mind? Nothing. I mean, it's just screaming, really, in your head. I don't think there's anything coherent that happens after that, really. You just kind of move. You just try to move toward anything that makes sense. And for weeks there, nothing made sense. I couldn't possibly have cancer, let alone stage four cancer. That was, that was stupid. That couldn't be true. It couldn't be true that nobody could even describe just where the cancer was, that there was so much of it. That can't possibly be true. <laughs> it was too late, really. I mean, it had already spread. So stage one is it hasn't, it grows. And stage two is it's abutting things. And three, it's starting to spread beyond the initial organ. And four, it means you're screwed in some fundamental way. So at that point, it's kind of like feathers. Like it's just... Touching everywhere. Yeah. And so at that point, for everybody, it means there's just no easy path. Like at that point, you're like off the super highway. And you're onto the super bumpy road of like, nobody knows if you're going to be okay. I listened carefully, but none of it made any sense. Hmm. As I've learned, one of the bits of wisdom that we do in our bodies is we let go. We let go of stuff as quickly as we have to. Because I had to surrender immediately to a surgery in which I didn't know what they would find. And immediately to like a body and a life that wasn't anything close to the one that I'd had. And so you kind of learn to let go a lot faster than you even think you will, like you're jumping into water and just kind of accept the shock of it being that cold. Who was your primary support through that journey? One of the hilarious parts of being part of a university community and then one attached to a, a research hospital was that when I woke up from the surgery, I was probably only, I mean, conservatively about a seven to eight minute walk away from most of my friends' offices. And they're all pastors. So everybody just like busted their clerical collar out of their gym bag and then violated chaplaincy rules. I mean, at some point, I think the nurse was like, I'm sorry, how many personal pastors do you have? And I was like, I have 12, 12 to 24. It's un unclear to me. I mean, because my I'm Canadian and my family was still desperately trying to like get flights and come see me, I was absolutely surrounded by my beautiful divinity school community who really know what to do. Hmm. Like they really, really know what to do at the edge of things. Presence is such a gift. We've got hymns. We've got anointing oil. We got centuries of beautiful traditions that people bust out. And I just, I felt really lucky to be bubble wrapped by that much beauty and prayer. And I got so much like anointing oil on my forehead. I was positive that I'd have like, uh, like an acne shaped cross there by the time <laughs> I left. 
And then just like hands, like the feeling of someone's hands on your shoulders or on your head. I don't think there's anything that feels better to me if I'm just about to go into a surgery than like, than somebody's just like looking at me without fear. All these pastors, they've all done weddings, but anyone can do a wedding. And they've all done baptisms. And some people can do baptisms, but they've all done funerals. And it takes a certain kind of person to have something to say that close to the edge, I think. So how long was it from the time that you got the phone call with the diagnosis to your first surgery? Probably only a couple hours. Like it was wild. Oh, it was wow. really, yeah. And the phone call is within the college campus because the hospital is just like down the sidewalk, basically. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you hang up and you just sort of walk in a daze down to the ER on the college campus. And check myself in. Yeah. Wow. And what was your relationship like with your oncologist? When you get a diagnosis, you don't really just get an oncologist. You get like a whole group of people, a surgical oncologist, and then an oncologist who's kind of like a pharmacist, but who's supposed to be a quarterback. And then they put me almost right away in a clinical trial uh, two states away. So I actually didn't really ever have like a doctor, really, like in a traditional way. I had like a whole bunch of people who had a different relationship to my illness, like somebody who cut it out, somebody who was at Duke, but not really like overseeing my care. And then clinical trials are probably best imagined now in retrospect as like a kind of experiment that you're participating in, but you're not really getting care in the traditional way. You're not, you don't have somebody who's looking at you and thinking like, how can we tailor this to meet your need. They're, they're just, they're fitting you into an experiment that they're running and that may or may not be what's good for you, but you won't really have a choice about that. Hmm. So did you move? I had to spend one day a week on an airplane. I'd get up at 3.45 a.m. and then I would drive to the airport and I would uh, get on a plane and I'd fly to Atlanta. And then by 7 a.m., I was headed to the hospital, and then I would be there, and I would take a flight that usually came back at midnight. And then I would get up at about 5, 6 a.m. to be a mom. Wow. So it was it was brutal. I did that for over a year, and it Ugh. felt honestly like I was on a weird. It was very Groundhog's Day. Every week kind of felt the same. It was like spring, Atlanta airport, fall, Atlanta airport. You must have been extremely fatigued as well. Yeah. I'm a huge faker, though, so I think that was hard for people to tell. But, yeah, I was really tired. I was tired all the time. It wasn't just that I had to get, like, an infusion, but I have to be attached to a chemo pack for three more days, and that was really uncomfortable. So they'd be, like, injecting you for another three days, and then I'd kind of get only a couple days off to recover, and then I'd have to do the whole thing over again. But I was so determined not to let it take more of my life than mm. it already was. And so I had a hard time figuring out how, how much to allow like the being tired or all that to kind of be present. I, in retrospect, I probably should have just like allowed the reality of it to be a little bit more real, but I was so scared that I was just like barreling forward. Hmm. Did you end up losing your hair? Colon cancer, people don't normally lose their hair because they, it's just not those drugs. It's usually like breast cancer, some of the ones more commonly associated with women. Your son was two at the time of your diagnosis? Yeah, just barely two. What was it like to be in this fight for your life while also caring for a child who barely has any understanding of what death is? Well, I mean, sometimes that's a gift because you get to just be there with him 
and he was he's just so fun he smells like applesauce you know and he was always like wanted to be a cat or something and <laughs> and like one day you're in the hospital watching everybody die and then the next day you're like making sock puppets like I felt kind of wonderful in that way just to be able to really really be his mom and I always felt like the hardest best work that I would do is to like really really be very present and able to not trade the future you know like fear of the future for the present that I did have Hmm. so in some ways it was a real gift to have a a little kid when I was at my most sick. Yeah. And it, it almost seems like the littler the child, the more in the present moment they are. Yeah. 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 They're all like noodly and ridiculous. (laughs) Yeah. You were saying that it felt like groundhog day. What did that day consist of over and over again? Waking up in the morning, remembering again that I had cancer, being horrified again because you Mm -hmm. forget. Like when you're asleep, you're just, you forget. Then you wake up and you're like, come on. And then you're you again. So trying to like create enough momentum to manage that and manage whatever cancer piece that was. And that was, sometimes it was surgeries and that was like much more dramatic, but the rest of the time it was sort of the everyday pain and the side effects because side effects are cumulative. So you're like, oh crap, I kind of lost my, for a while there I like lost feeling in the end of my nose or like my ears or my fingers. And for a while I couldn't walk. And what it, you're kind of like taking stock, I guess, in that day and it'll change. And then everybody's living their lives and nobody cares about cancer in the best way. They're just living. So you have to, like, get a tune. Just, like, don't be a dick, you know? You just have to really <laughs> focus on not being a dick because pain makes you narcissistic. So you have to figure out how to, like, take your meds, focus on other people. I always love to get a little bit of work done because I love discovery, and it felt so nice to go somewhere else with my brain. Mm. And so I, that whole year I wrote a book about women in ministry Wow. And it was really fun. I interviewed people like in the cancer clinic. I'd have lovely megachurch preacher's wives come by and I would interview them. And I just needed something really meaningful to do. Not, I didn't want to crochet. I wanted to like, I mean, and God bless crocheting, but I just wanted to do something hard. I like the feeling of doing something hard. And then openly struggle against fear. Tried desperately to manage not listening to sad things on the radio or let people say too many stupid things around you that you hate them. And then call a friend. Again, don't be a dink. And then I would shut it down early just to make sure that I didn't start to have one of those conversations you used to have in college at 2 a.m. You know what I mean? Where you're like, what is life? You're like, it's really important to not have that conversation when you're like so fragile. Hmm. So that was a typical day. the fear inherent in in any pain is like but yeah but when is it going to end like you can go through something really hard if you can see an end point Mm -hmm. but the perpetuity of something is like the the word like fear really takes over so I think like that was scary because I wasn't sure it would ever get better but it wasn't scary as in this will be life limiting I never had that and I'd never known anybody who'd had a life limiting problem it just seemed insane to me that someone could be, and especially in academia where you're like at peak academia when you're like 85 and your brain is like at master level, <laughs> nin, nin, ninja level history. So <laughs> the rest was like learning to make peace with short horizons and never letting somebody s- s- pretend that they knew the future just because it made them feel better, hmm. which is why I grew to <laughs> love have loathe some feelings toward most of Christian sentimentality. Hmm. Christians are always the worst about wanting to 
kind of say the most extreme thing because they felt like it gave them like sentimental traction. Like, how did the dying teach us how to live? You know who teach us how to live? Jesus. And also just trying to live. So, or like, won't heaven be amazing? <laughs> I think that it's an overrealized eschatology that pretends <laughs> that, that 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 will make everything right. So I just not letting me or anybody else skip to the end. Hmm. Yeah. So what are some of the best words that we could say to somebody who might be in a similar experience to what you were going through? Yeah. Well, I loved it when people were really just like careful with their assumptions. Like they just never assumed that they knew that. So it always drove me crazy when people, um, they would say things like terminal. And I was like, oh gosh, like, I don't know. And neither do you. Like that seems a bit <laughs> dramatic. Or the, you know, the, the trite phrases, like everything happens for a reason. Always imagining that I've gained so much in perspective. That always made me really sad, as if, like, some people are selected, pre-selected for lessons and everybody else just gets to be lucky. Mm -hmm. That seemed not right. Or that I needed to trust God. I, I mean, absolutely trust God, but, like, that was such a weird way to say it. Like, I've always thought, like, well, trust God to do what exactly? For my complete healing? Maybe. I pray for that, but, like, maybe, maybe not. So I loved it when people just said stuff like, um... You know, you are so loved. Mm. I am here with you. I am praying for, for peace and courage for you. I also loved it when people who really knew me were like, I'm praying for your, no pressure on you, but I'm, I'm praying for your complete healing. And I just want you to know I love you. Mm. Like it felt like having hope for me without like saddling me with it. Because to some you become like an expectation of a miracle. And, and who, can, who can guarantee a miracle? Yeah. I think people accidentally saddle the suffering with their own questions and like existential fears. So sometimes I could like feel people trying to like rehearse their own fears through my experience where they'd be like, Oh, it must be terrible to have a young child and be facing the, and like, I can tell they're like struggling through their own, Oh, I'm scared that I'm not going to be the parent I want to be or et cetera, et cetera. And hmm. I always just thought, um, there's no predicted ending to this story. And, and also, like, we don't get to know what enough is. Like, we just have to pray for it. Like, we just have to pray that God pours love and peace and courage and everything that we're going to need, enough beauty to, like, sustain us. But we don't get to, like, use other people to kind of figure out if we have enough in our own life. Hmm. That always felt kind of cruel. That long season felt like perpetual crisis. It kind of felt like Smokey the Bear style, like the arrow is on red and you're like, no one is allowed to start fires around this. <laughs> like mm -hmm. it, is, it is too flammable. And that feeling and kind of heightened reality lasted for almost two years. Wow. Honestly, if you ask people who love me, I mean, lovely, lovely, perfect people, it really probably only lasted in their minds for about six months. Because I think it's just really hard to stay in that kind of heightened present with somebody forever. And I think sometimes because we love people that we start to assume that they're going to be okay. Mm. Because we just can't imagine that the people we love could suffer for that long. So for me, the, the Bananasville time of like nonstop hospital, I have a hospital outfit, I have a hospital personality, I have friends who are administrators who work at the hospital. Like, my hospital life really lasted for about two years. And then it became something different, something that wasn't a crisis but a chronic condition. And that's kind of when I started to, because I've always tried to have, like, research interests around, like, why we explain suffering, the suffering of others in the way we do. And so that, for me, kind of moved from wondering why we needed to explain away suffering to like, why is it so hard to imagine life as a chronic condition? So that's when I got really interested in the idea of like precarity and how delicate our lives are and just how thin our language is for just being okay with like people like me who have chronic cancer that might only Smokey the Bear style, like not be red anymore, but might kind of hover between like yellow and orange. So I've gone up and down between yellow and orange multiple times now. So sometimes I think I'm like almost in green. 
That feels really good. I'm, like, great at children's birthday parties again, you know. I'm, like, a normal person. And then I start to kind of have something happen. But it's all, like, just like a lot of people's health issues. It's just unfolding. So I've been in a chronic place now for about three years. And um, I've had, like, multiple scares along the way. This is the place that I'm trying to live Hmm. where I'm, like, not right up at the edge of the cliff. I'm, like, a few steps back, but I have to, like, kind of build permanent shelter here. And then I can see it in other people, and that part feels like a gift. Honestly, that part feels like the... I feel really lucky for that part. Hmm. You can't, like, go through something like that and not see how hard life is for everyone else, you know. Hmm. Hmm. That part I'm not sorry for, but everything else is a huge pain in the ass. about what you just said drew that emotion out like were you thinking about someone specific it's just like a feeling where you see it all the time like whenever I'm in the cancer clinic I feel like I see it most clearly like people are so thin or they're just like so they're struggling they can't hide how much they're struggling but if you sit there for long enough I don't just see that anymore because at first that's always what I I feel. I feel scared when I walk in there because I don't want that to be me. Like, I don't want to be the sick one anymore. I don't want to be the... But then if you sit there long enough, uh, you can start to see, like, all the love. Like, you can see people, like, leaning against each other or, like, wrapping each other in these little blankets or the way someone, like, reaches over to, like, tuck the hair behind someone else's ear. and, And then I start to feel really comfortable there. And I think, yeah these are my people. This is everybody, but like, these are, these are my people. And then when the pandemic started, it just felt so natural to me. Like when you see the person on the bus at the bus stop, that just honestly didn't have any place to go. That sight seemed so familiar to me. It was just all those of us who can't pretend and that there's a, like an incredible beauty in knowing that like, those are really people that are God's beloved you know, the people who can't pretend. Hmm. I think precarity is such a weird thing. It's such a great word, too. It's like a Dorothy Day word from the 1920s and 30s. Like, when Dorothy Day, that, like, Catholic activist, would use it, she would describe it as a thing that she, she worked mostly with people experiencing homelessness. And the way she talked about it, she didn't talk about it like it was a thing to be overcome, but a state to, to live alongside And I'd spent so long studying the self-help and wellness industry, having researched the prosperity gospel for so long. And I was always surrounded by people who were always imagining, like, good, better, best, just get past it. And then the second I was kind of stuck with a chronic condition, it really helped me make peace with this, like, this idea of, of precarity. Like, man, we are so delicate. And all the things that make our lives could be taken away in an instant, And that's not fun to say at parties, but if you know that, there's like a weird hospitality you can have Mm -hmm. there where you're like, yeah, welcome to this club. I think we're all in this club. Right. And some of us are just more acutely aware of it, mostly due to circumstances we didn't choose. Yeah. I think that was maybe like the worst part about being sick was the idea that like I felt like I was on the other side of plexiglass and people would say like, oh, how sad. Mm. And it kind of helped me the longer I lived with it to be like, oh, no, no. I mean, yes, very sad. It's been the worst. <laughs> <laughs> but also, here it is. Here's here's where we live. Here's where we all live. And then my prayer was just, okay, God, like, help me see things the way they really are. And that way, when I saw somebody who seemed, like, especially lucky, you know, mm. it didn't fill me with resentfulness anymore. I remember I was, like, really sick. I was in New York. I was wearing my chemo pack. And this... 
a really like handsome businessman across the street and he was wearing this perfectly cut suit and he was on the phone and he, he was like rah, rah, rah. he had this like super important life he was off to and I oh, like almost out loud was like must be nice like I was totally sure that his life must be like immune from sorrow and I it's taken me a bit to like walk that back because hmm. I've seen enough people whose lives just you know are made of toothpicks and and then I think if we could all live here with a little bit more honesty, it would help the people who are, like, suffering more acutely not feel quite so lonely. Hmm. I'm guessing that for a span of time, you took a break from your employment. Is that correct? I don't remember. I'm sure I did, technically. I think I was on medical leave for a bit. I just don't remember because I was researching a new book that whole time. So I think maybe it was like a couple weeks and I was like, oh, gosh, I need something to do. You you worked with students all the way through all of this treatment? Well, my job isn't mostly students, to be honest. Like uh, I work at like a, the Divinity School is kind of half teaching, half research, half like going to faculty meetings and asking more about the incredible history of John Wesley. I think I was even at faculty meetings pretty quickly in my hospital outfit <laughs> and they and I was not asked to be there yeah. I was just like hi what's going on guys I was just curious what we're doing right now yes I I gave lectures I don't recall being asked to give lectures so I was quite present hmm. during that time has there been a shift since that time in the way that your life looks yeah what has that shift looked like I felt very humbled by my illness. Sounds like a weird way of putting it, but like I had really imagined that my life would be able to be reasonably shiny for some time because I had been so focused on like trying to first trying to like get into a good program, then trying to get into another good program, then trying to write that first dissertation to become a book, and then the book becomes a job, and then uh, like I was on a full hustle super track. And it was out of the mistaken <laughs> assumption that I would have like all the time in the world and that there'd be some later date in which I would like set my own pace and be more than one thing. And after I got sick, I realized that there wasn't necessarily always a later. And even if there was, it would just be different because I'm different. And so hmm. I, I just was really interested in hearing about other people's stories like our what are some of the messages other people who are suffering here? Why does it feel so hard to suffer in this country? What is its relationship with positive thinking? And so really, um, it was right during the beginning of that chronic season that I kind of shifted gears by starting a podcast because I really, I was very lonely <laughs> and I wanted to talk to other people to just kind of like thicken up my language. And then that became... A, a tremendous source of joy for me and purpose. I felt, yeah, really connected all of a sudden with people. My memoir had been called Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. And I loved the um, lies I've loved piece because I didn't, I just felt like, gosh, don't we all feel like intoxicated by these beautiful things that are not entirely true, but are mostly true. So what are some alternatives to that idea? So then I called the podcast, Everything Happens, period. And then I wanted to talk to people who were kind of thinking around some of the same themes. At first, it was sort of like disappointment, fear, kinds of like theodicy questions. Like, how do you deal with the wanting to live with beauty and truth, but still kind of being overwhelmed by how hard life is. And then I was like, gosh, like, well, then how do we live with fear? And so then I started interviewing fear researchers. And then I was like, gosh, how do we not be these wild, rugged individualists? So I talked to people who could help me understand, like, interdependence. And that would just kind of sprawled into how do I not see life as a problem to be solved? Hmm. Get past the formula self-help paradigm that like I if I just knew the right six steps to living with chronic pain that I could somehow get back to I don't know whatever ineffable magic normal people seem to have 
Yeah. Well, I think it's mostly the illusion of control. Yes, I totally agree. I missed that. I really Mm. did miss that. (laughs) The illusion of control. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I really did. Yeah. It's kind of a drug. And then you watch it in other people. It seems so intoxicating. Mm. I still kind of get jealous sometimes when I see like people walking purposefully through airports. But then I'm like, oh, okay, okay, okay. (laughs) It's just, just, (laughs) we can't piece this whole thing together. When you started your podcast, did you have a particular listener in mind? Yeah, I called them Sad NPR, and <laughs> <laughs> I I realized that my favorite kind of conversations were always kind, smart, and funny, and that it would kind of help shake loose some of the overt sentimentality of some of the attempts to make meaning that I had been listening to. So, so I was looking for people who kind of didn't necessarily care that I was a Christian, but wouldn't like hold it against me. And so I, I, so that's, those are the people I found. I, I, the, the people that, um, that I feel like I get to be in a community with are usually two kinds of people. One are the people who've really gone through something they know in a second. Like if I say before and after they have a moment that comes to mind and I love those people, those people don't get to get over it. They just have to live through it. Hmm. So We make all kinds of lovely things for them because I love them. And then the other group tends to be people who feel called to serve those people in some kind of way, but are also sort of trying to live with a kind of existential courage that we need. So they're often like teachers and doctors and social workers and pastors and that type of person who kind of like feels that magnetic desire to live close to instability, but they don't necessarily have to deal with it in their personal lives. And those kinds of people are everywhere. And it's, it's fun to structure those as conversations around like really interesting existential theological questions. Like how much can we change or Mm. how do I live with this much fear? I feel renewed and I feel like I get to like any good conversation that there's discovery and that the discovery gets to be the gift that's not work. That's just, that's joy. What is an indicator that comes to mind that you were successfully reaching that audience? It's amazing listening to the intensity of people's stories. And so we get hundreds of messages every month and then we get to pray for them and think about how to make things for them. So the, and that's also the joy of social media, honestly, is having that reciprocity in that community where you can kind of tell that it's for them because they receive it and then they ask for something Hmm. like it. Or, um, I mean, it ranges from like, Hey, I'm, I'm losing my husband. I've got a couple months. We listen to the podcast and talk about how we want to live the lives we have now. Or I'm a pastor and I've been unbelievably lonely and scared during this pandemic. And I don't know what to do about this and this and this. And thanks for giving me the term precarity or that's what also feels really fun about the, like the lexicon that we get to have is like, you get to give people a term that they might be able to find useful in their own lives. So those messages are always such a gift. And we send a lot of presents, to be honest, we send a lot of cards and things to people who are struggling. That's really sweet. Because I liked cards and I liked presents a lot. (laughs) I feel like thanks to your kindness, but also presents. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I can really relate to what you're saying about giving people words to describe what they're feeling. And I think as songwriters, that's a big part of what we do as well. And, you know, we're not changing the way that people experience their lives, but somehow in giving them language to describe what they're feeling, they can process it yeah. in a different way and they, they can hold it differently and it doesn't feel as heavy. Yes. And so I think in, in that way, words are so powerful and they can be such a gift. Yeah. And I also wanted to say, like, especially during this pandemic, I'm trying to think, it 
it might have been like several months ago where I stumbled across your Instagram profile and just the way that you speak blessing over us <laughs> has been so helpful to me and has brought so much peace and a sense of solidarity and a reminder that, I mean, as selfish as this sounds, like I am not the only one going through yeah. this yeah. pandemic. Like we're, we're all experiencing that. Yes. And, and so the words that you give to us feel like such a gift. Oh, thanks. Well, I would say the same thing about your music. I heard like a good analogy the other day. It made me think of you. It's talking about like the relationship that music has with the divine. And it was from Jeremy Begbie. He's this wonderful musician, theologian we have at the Divinity School. And he often does these lectures where he's like, blah, 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 blah. And just like plays a piano and like has some kind of lecture. And it's like Mr. Rogers. Like, it's like, oh, it's, uh, and God sounds like this. Ding, ding. Um, but sometimes that when we try to think about whether we're able to come alongside people or help people, we imagine it spatially like enoughness and whether God is taking up room and we're kind of adjusting to allow God to take up enough room. And um, Jeremy said it was better understood as sonic, as if that when God's notes ring, like when people play the glasses and you can hear all the overtones, that the truth rings through us. Mm -hmm. And then there's nothing more or less about that. You know, it's just, it's all more. And so when I listen to your music, I feel that way about the moreness of that amazing relationship with the divine. And I think that's, that's just like a real gift you're giving. Well, thank you. You gave me chills. <laughs> <laughs> very sad. It's medium sad. Uh, I've just been trying to figure out how to live with life as a chronic condition. It felt like kind of a mind bender, honestly. And I have such a desire to rush into the future and figure it out. And so I've been trying to kind of just think through the advice I've been given about whether anyone can even do that. Mm -hmm. So that's what writing that book called No Cure for Being Human. <laughs> I wasn't sure they'd let me title the book that way because it's so depressing, but I like it. Um, I really want to be someone of like deep hope and also just like real courage to be able to, without pivoting back to certainties or even like goals, to be able to have like a wider aperture for being able to live with that mix of like past and present and future. Hmm. This book is me struggling with that and trying to trying to land on being okay with unfinishedness. I guess that means I'm like a bit of a nightmare with goals. There will be no vision boards for <laughs> yeah. me. I, um, every time I get to do something, I, I genuinely feel so grateful when I, I ever get to, I get, like I got to write, a, I got to write a book and I feel, I, if I was, I also got to feel like I really told the truth. And that always feels, mm. it's like very private for me to write. So I always feel super lucky if anybody reads it. Because mm. I really, because I said the things there that I wouldn't always say out loud. So I'll just end with like, uh, well, if you want to ask me anything, I'll just be like, but I wrote a book, period. I have no other plans. <laughs> <laughs> Is this your second book? It's my fourth. Wow. I wrote a a hilariously long history of the prosperity gospel. And then I wrote my very sad memoir, Everything Happens for a Reason. And then I wrote my history of women in ministry called The Preacher's Wife. And then now I've got No Cure for Being Human. You know, I don't think most of our theology really should be market tested. I think that uh, <laughs> the truth of a claim should not be made while staring around to see who agrees and how many likes it gets. I have a job that pays me, so now I actually don't have to really, in the end, be market beholden. So yeah. I feel like I've said stuff, and I hope I'll continue to say stuff that I do not think will be very popular. Hmm. How do we speak to a broader public about these deep theological questions 
and how do we be market sensitive but not market beholden is a challenge to all of us all the time. So that's something I think we'll all continue to wrestle with. But I saw it so overtly in watching the prosperity gospel rampantly take over churches over 10,000 plus and then take over a great number of the major social media platforms. So I think it will always be countercultural to say things like not everything is possible, hmm. comma, Joel Osteen, period. Yeah, it's a weird space. the word like grief is a really good one to to think about like the universality of what we've all been experienced like we all kept losing things and then plans and then sometimes people and I think the thing that cancer probably was a helpful or unhelpful um, trial run in was um, in managing finitude like I think if people always think of cancer or they think of like managing death or fear of death and I really don't think it's just I don't think it's death I think it's like just the feeling of having numbered days and I know that sounds like a, like an overly picky distinction but like we all have finitude even if someone gets a miracle we all still we all still die in the end and yeah. I I think part of accepting finitude for me feels like just trying to get my my footing around the the feeling that like for all of this like there's no cure for this like I'm really hoping that we'll all get vaccinated and we will all be managing you know chronic public health as a global society but like this whole thing makes us like forever be bound up in our bodies and in our limited lives and in our limited resources and that feels really honest to me where we don't get to have like endless everything because I, you know, I study cultural scripts about like bucket lists and if you just conquer your inbox and like there's all these, you could just carpe diem or the neo-Buddhist obsession with being present as if being present solves the problem inherently. But like there's no, there's no solution to this. There's no, there's certainly no one solution to this. So I feeling like we're all living here in that space has kind of felt really weirdly comforting that maybe we have a little bit more of a framework for that than we did before. I felt like before I was kind of the like aberration. I was like the sad story. And I I really hope we can all feel a little more comfort with our finitude. Yeah, I mean, we do have these sort of scripts that we fall back on over and over again. What does being comfortable with your finitude mean for you as you wake up every day? And I mean, obviously you're a very driven person, like through your entire treatment, you were continuing to go to staff meetings and things like that, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that may have been pathological. I, <laughs> I regret some of that, but yes, yes, I do. Yes, I, re I regret that. I regret that now that you're confronting me with that truth. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I kept hoping that I would, I think part of why I was so driven that I'm trying to reconsider is that I was really trying to check off all the boxes. Like, I was so scared about cancer that I thought, like, well, then I just need to get life done. Like, I really need to, I need to do it. And some of that impulse, which you can see with people's responses to the pandemic, makes a lot of sense to me. People want to go on that trip or, you know, have that experience or, I mean, there's so much desire to, like, make up for lost time by having something that they feel that can pour from the present back into the past and fill it up. Hmm. I think it's just our fear. And we say this crap all the time when we say things like, well, nothing is wasted, right? Like, like every single thing has to add up to more. That's why sometimes the phrase like be present or an obsession with mastery over mind, which frankly is a deeply pernicious religious tradition stemming over a hundred years that I hope we give up. There is no such thing as mastery over the mind. But like the idea that if we could just figure out how to master the present, collect every moment, that like somehow we won't have to feel the weight of our finitude. We won't have to worry that there's 
that like we'll we'll feel like we finally got it done. And I I think we all know enough wonderful people old and young who look back on their lives or look forward and just have the little inclination to wonder if that's not really what this is about. The magic of our lives is the loves that we have. There will be no finishing this because if you're doing it right, there will never be enough. You will never have enough love. You will never not want to love the people you've been given. And in fact, the more you love them, the more completely painful it will be to lose them. Hmm. So we're not doing it right if we got it done. I think we're doing it right if we just have so much love that it will be impossible to ever let it go. I think that's, I think that's the love God calls us to. So much of what you have to say is informed by the suffering associated with your cancer diagnosis, trouble with infertility. All of this pain informed your perspective counter to the prosperity gospel and these ideas of wishful thinking that a segment of the culture largely embraces. Who do you think you would be if the cancer diagnosis never came along? If life was just smooth sailing for you? I think I would be um, dumber, maybe happier, (laughs) Um, luckier, and more impervious to other people's pain. I don't think I would know nearly the way that I do now in my bones that structures in our culture are not usually designed to hold us up and that most people don't have enough. I think I would have guessed at that. I think I would have understood it really well intellectually, but I don't think I'd be nearly as um, kicked down to the lower rungs of the ladder as I have been. That part is a weird gift. That is a weird gift, but I am really grateful to know it. It's really nice to have voices like Kate's in the world, don't you? Yes. It's such a wonderful reminder to me that life is not an equation. It's not if I do everything right, if I never sin, if I pray, if I pray hard enough, that everything will go the way that I want it to. And in fact, life is is full of hardship and pain. But God is there with us, even in the midst of that, and there is still beauty and hope to be found in those dark places. So thank you, Kate, for reminding us of that. I love following her on Instagram, and I look forward to reading her new book that just came out this week, No Cure for Being Human. You can find out more about Kate at her website, katebowler.com. That's K A T E. B-O-W-L-E-R dot com. This episode of Instrumental was produced by me, JJ Heller. And me, Dave Heller. Our theme music is my song, Big Love, Small Moments. That I helped write. (laughs) You can always listen to JJ's songs by telling your smart speaker to play music by JJ Heller. We'll be back next week with another episode of Instrumental. So be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts.